I just say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of you guys, have been for more than a decade. Um, it's, it's such a thrill to have my, uh, three of my favorite rappers up here, uh, and especially to introduce Google LA to the awesomeness of Nerdcore. Uh, so here to my right, we have uh, MC Frontalot, the godfather of Nerdcore. Hello. His latest album is Net Split, or The Fathomless Heartbreak of Online Itself. You memorized that whole album title. <laughs> yeah. No mean feat. Yeah, 25 minutes studying. Miss Eves, um, the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, multimedia artist by day and fierce femsy by night. Her latest EP is sad. I'm a sad girl. <laughs> <laughs> And Schaefer, and Schaefer the Dark Lord, the supervillain of Nerdcore. His latest album is The Department of Darkness. So let's start with the basics. What is Nerdcore? Oh, oh, it's a, it's a little subgenre of hip hop um, where you could don't have to be like cool. <laughs> you know, it's like hip hop is cool. It's like the coolest kind of music in popular culture. And generally, if you're trying to do some hip hop, you're expected to be the coolest person in the room. Maybe start trends, that kind of thing. Uh, but maybe you just want to do it by yourself with your computer. Um, so then you have Nerdcore for that. That's cool. So what kind of reactions do you get when you tell people that you're a Nerdcore rapper? Uh, some blank stares sometimes. Uh, mostly blank stares. No, people, people understand if they're like... I feel people, the average civilian can put it together based on those context clues, but I don't get blank stares. I get a lot of like this. Yeah, yeah. So uh, how has this changed over the last 20 years that you've been doing this? Um, actually, right when, it, right when I came up with that term, it, uh, it was really easy to get press because reporters are just famously lazy and they would hear nerdcore you mean like rap plus nerds? I could get, you know, five column inches out of that. I'll immediately cover that and then go back to finding other work not to do. And so that was fantastic. I would, I would get covered all the time. And then now 20 years later, uh, it's kind of like, oh, like nerds doing stuff, huh? It's much, much less exciting to uh, the press. And I guess it also probably seems obvious to random strangers who haven't heard of it before. But we're also better, 20 years better at doing it. So maybe we can get some attention that way. <laughs> yeah, I think we've, we've developed more skills in 20 years, but the content has changed because I feel like there were a lot of kind of novelty songs in the beginning where it's rap, but it's about Zelda and Pokemon. And now it seems like it's mostly a bunch of people who are aging and now writing songs about how... Uh, unhappy they are there's a <laughs> there is a there is a a pretty consistent theme throughout the nerdcore acts that are still operating of making themselves vulnerable and exposing all of their sort of inner turmoil which is kind of what it's shifted into i feel also like popular hip-hop has embraced all of the little nerd pop culture stuff that used to be um obscure or strange to the culture at large like i don't think that there's any gangster rapper who hasn't discussed their gaming console in a song and what the Jizza did a whole science record, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of, of nerd stuff in proper hip hop now. We are completely superfluous. <laughs> Welcome to our goodbye party. <laughs> <sighs> MC Frontalot, th this started for you as a hobby, and you were a, a web designer before. What made you think that this could be a real thing? Um, I was super fortunate in that I was freelancing, uh, so the hobby just slowly built up a fan base and people were asking me to do shows and do make a CD, and so I could just kind of do those things a little bit at a time and see how it worked and have fewer and fewer clients and more and more shows until all of a sudden it was just a rap career. So I had, there was none of the bravery you imagine in embarking in your early middle age in a music career. I just... Uh, <laughs> eased into it. 
So your your first tour with uh, your first album, Nerdcore Rising, that, that was pretty easy. Just kind of show up and sing. Or what, what was it like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd always been into home recording, and I'd, I'd been like a four track person in college. Um, and then the computers, much to my excitement, became fast enough to have you know high res music studios inside them on the desktop. Um, so my first project with that was to make uh, some rap songs um, out of you know samples from my CD collection. Anyway, I came at it from home recording, so it was kind of easy to just make a record because I'd already been goofing around with how to make songs. How, Shan, how did you start recording? Uh, I was just recording in my closet, and I had this pantyhose that I put over like a hanger that was a pop filter. That's how you make a pop filter. Yeah, and then I just recorded in my closet. Schaefer, you mentioned every. You mentioned uh, nerdcore rappers getting older and writing songs about being sad uh so um one of your albums was uh sick passenger and you put a lot of your personal life into that one yeah yeah i did i've uh i spent a long time really posturing with this like sort of maniacal out of control satanist character that i played on stage and i did a concept album because nobody I, I felt that there weren't a lot of people making concept albums anymore and i grew up on all this great classic rock of the 70s where people would write these kind of sweeping rock operas and i wanted to write a concept album so i wrote an album about my experiences in therapy that ended up being uh a lot more unguarded than i thought i thought i was going to do this kind of parody of what therapy was but halfway through the project it just turned real um, and I have, there's skits with a voice actor playing my therapist. And every time I would like kind of write material for it, I had to go to my actual therapy sessions and talk to my real life doctor about it. And then I would take notes, give those notes to, to the voice actor. To, uh, and it got, it turned into this weird Ouroboros of art and sadness. Um, but it ended up being a very like positive experience for me because I found th that there was that I could write about real experiences from my life and connect with an audience without feeling like I had to specifically pander to any of my, any of my fans with, you know, explicit video game or anime references. Which is great for you because you hate your fans and you would despise pandering to them or making them happy in any way. That everything you just said is true. <laughs> I do just have a lot of contempt in my heart. <laughs> He's a dark Lord, ladies and gentlemen. I'm playing my part. Miss Eves, on your latest EP, uh, you have a song, Homebody, which is about, uh, has the refrain at the end, read a good book, uh, and it's about uh, being an introvert. Do you identify as an introvert? Oh, I'm definitely an introvert, but I also love attention. I love it when people clap for me, so that's why I like to perform. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's, <laughs> that's why I like to perform, but I need to spend a lot of time alone in my house. I love eating peanut butter directly from the jar. Um, so I reference that in the song. I think that's the most nerdcore number you have in your catalog. Yeah. The, the... <laughs> I, yeah, because technically I this has been like a big education on nerdcore because I don't identify as nerdcore. But what I've been told is that I am a nerd this whole tour. <laughs> <laughs> People are saying that they're they're trying to be nice to you when they say that at the they're show. Like, oh, you mean, yeah? <laughs> you're a nerd. It's not like when people yelled that at us uh, in school. <laughs> are, are you happy with that? Is um, well, I'm like a really big weirdo and a really big like misfit, and so like I identify with not like being cool. You know, I've become so weird that I am cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how about you guys? What, what is it like being an introvert and, you know, going up on stage? That's your career. Yeah. I also like attention. I found a career in the performing arts served that pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. The validation's great. And also, if you get, like, like marginally notable in your, in your music field, you can take as much time for yourself as you want because you can pretend to be busy. Oh, like, oh, I'm working. I must be working on some projects for the next three weeks since the you know this game I wanted came into early access. But that's not what I'm working on. I have gotten out of attending weddings. I, be, I just, I mean, I've got a deadline for this record. I know I've known you since childhood. Uh, best of luck. Yeah, I think that that's shared by all of us. I I also left to my own devices. I would 
by far prefer to spend all of my time at home noodling around with music projects and not going into the out of doors. And then every couple months we have to, you know, travel around the country and be hyper social because it's such, um, especially when that, you know, that skill of interacting with groups of people kind of atrophies after spending months and months alone. It's, uh, it's pretty intense to have to, you know, travel around and do lots of meet and greets and, and talk to an audience, but I still love their attention and still want their distance. <laughs> Just several arm lengths. So it's fun when you do it and then you have to cool down afterwards for a yeah, while. Yeah. I, I, I do kind of escape. I, I don't know if you've both noticed, but I do tend to like disappear for about 20 minutes after the set. Yeah. That's crying. <laughs> Could I also introduce uh, our drummer that we brung? This is Beard Science. Is your mic on? I think it is. Nice. His mic's on. <laughs> Another round of applause for his mic being on. Thank you. Empowering women is a theme in, in all of your music. Uh, Miss Eves, you have a song, uh, Miss Emoji. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so my song, Miss Emoji, is about men telling me to smile, which really <laughs> irritates me. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> because I have a range of emotions that aren't just happiness. And so like, if I'm like bummed out about something and I'm just like walking down the street, even if men maybe don't find that attractive, I think it's my um, prerogative to wear my face like that. Potentially for 24 hours, maybe more. So that's like my clap back at people being like, smile, you would look better. Yeah, but there's a lot of pressure against female authenticity sometimes. Yeah, um, and I mean, I think too, it's just like the idea that a lot of people think that women should be decorative, even like, and almost, it's almost 2020. And I just like, don't, I mean, I think we have the right to also like not be attractive and that's cool. We're still valid and awesome and it's fine. You have another song off that same album, Feminasty, um, Thunder Thighs, right? Is that the same album? Yeah, that's yeah. it. <laughs> My big hit. Your monster hit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, about, uh, about body image. It's actually about um, when your thighs touch and you get that rash. You have a song called Yes. Yes. <laughs> about positive consent, enthusiastic consent. Yes. Yeah. Well, why, why is this important to you? Um, I felt that uh, once I got to a point where I had... I had amassed an audience and I could travel around and have a lot of very enthusiastic and impressionable, specifically young men in, in the room that um, I had reached a point where I could use this, this little modicum of influence that I had to do something good. And I found that this, there was like this pervasive theme of male fans just informing me what great guys they are. <laughs> and I know that's not true. <laughs> I know that they think they are. And so I, I have a song and a, a, an increasingly angry rant that happens during my set where I lecture about um, believing women and, uh, and preaching enthusiastic consent and, and basically challenging my audience on all of their self-image that, that, that they have invested in. And I feel that it's, it's important to remind um, these like men who are who have been rewarded for th anything that they ever, that ever pops into their head as being correct, thought it was important to try to correct some of that behavior with my platform. Friend a lot. Uh, your latest album is about a, a painful breakup. Would you mind saying who, who you broke up with? God, we just have like three sad sack records in a row. <laughs> I think it's because of the terrible moment we live in, partially. Yeah, but um, sure. my record is a breakup record about internet. Um, I, I got to retire this line, but it is not the kind of breakup where you'll never see the other person again. It's the kind of breakup where you insist to your friends that it is completely over, um, but you still make out behind the dumpster <laughs> over by the Best Buy. It's, a, it's just a bunch of songs about specific ways in which internet is awful now. Well, one of the songs on your album is Memes Are Dumb, uh, which is sort of a controversial opinion oh, yeah. here at Google. Especially what, what? with the all-ages crowds. We get a lot of pushback on that one. Yeah, why do you hate adorable cats? <laughs> Memes are actually fine, of course, right? Like, these, like, creativity sort of blossoming. Right. Like, I think a lot of people are getting their first taste of, like, making something when they participate in meme culture, and that's fantastic. 
but I'm a stodgy old now, and I would prefer for people to express an original thought. That's all. And also, it's hilarious to go up and make the whole crowd sing memes are dumb and have the little kids, like, aggressively doing the Fortnite dances at me from the front row. <laughs> Love it. Schaefer, you recently posted that uh, the latest generation of nerdcore rappers are better than you guys were when you started. So, uh, you know, I guess you're talking about rappers like Lex the Lexicon Artist and Miss Eves. Uh, and Shubzilla, um, Kadesh Flow, Oh My. There's, I mean, there have been... Creative Mind Frame. Creative Mind Frame. There have been a lot of, um, I don't know, just sort Sky of... blue. Generations, which is a, a, a pretentious phrase to use. But there have been these many, like, different tiers of nerdcore that have come after us in the 40 years that we've been doing this. 20, 20. Whatever. Uh, but, but no, I feel that when we started, we were all kind of, um, we were very clumsy at it. We didn't really know what we were doing. We were all hip hop fans. Learned as we went. We learned the basics of multi-track recording on four tracks in our basement. But it took, there was a, there was a pretty serious learning curve. It took us a long time to, to, do, to figure out how to be rappers without um, insulting this art form that we were paying tribute to. And I feel that there's this, as new rappers come into this community, they're coming in with like much more honed skill sets out of the gate than we had. I, it took me many years before I didn't think that I was just god awful at this. And I see these new rappers coming out being like, hey, I'm a rapper too. Here's my first single. And it just makes me angry because it took me 10 years to write anything <laughs> as close to as good as that. Um, I think there's also a different understanding right now of like what, a successful rapper is because there's all these kids coming up through SoundCloud who are basically just doing bedroom recordings with Fruity Loop and some garbage microphone, and they might very legitimately create a hit that way. Well, I'm not talking about their success. I'm just talking about their their skill level. Their sure, sure. I mean, I'm, we're still more successful than those kids <laughs> I just mentioned. <laughs> Wait a minute, I was one of the people that was mentioned. <laughs> I'm right here. Peep my band camp numbers, Eves. <laughs> There's so much collaboration in Nerdcore. Uh, I wanted to ask about that. So for you, I've counted uh, four songs that you did with just these two guys. Um, I don't know if I missed any, but what, what drives all that collaboration? Well, I really, I mean, I'm more like adjacent to Nerdcore. They're my friends. So I'm just like, yo, I want to get my friends on my track. I like really like what they're doing. I respect them as artists. So, yeah. <laughs> but it, it is sort of a scene, right? The, all, the, all these internet rappers who know each other. But the main reason we're on each other's tracks is because we can talk each other into it. Whereas if I called Jay-Z up, um, okay. I would get one of those recordings where you haven't reached the right number. <laughs> I mean, our friends are, are obviously a lot more accessible, but also by being friends, we know that their values are going to be in the right place. It's, it's terrible to... <laughs> I was just telling the story to Eves to get somebody to reach out to you on the internet and say, hey, I'm a big fan. I'd like to get you on one of my tracks. And you say, great. And then you go and scour their material and you find all of this horrific content that makes you think, like, why would you want to align yourself with me because I definitely don't want to be anywhere near you with that kind of content. And But, you know, being friends with hanging out at rooftop barbecues with Eves, you learn pretty quickly that we share a lot of the same yeah. value system. Um, this is for uh, Front A Lot. Um, when you first started uh, on your website, you would have your uh, face obscured by a, a colorful thing to the point where the first time I saw you live, um, no one in line knew what you looked like except for the one guy who is your backup. Uh, what uh, were you like, what made you decide finally to put your you know, face in, in there and out there? Uh, I did. I did do that. The original version of my website was supposed to create an air of mystery. And the photo gallery was pictures of uh, very famous rappers with their like like bars over their eyes or their faces blurred out. There'd like there'd be a picture of Biggie as an MC front a lot enjoys a pensive moment between stakes. Or there'd be like of an image of, you know, really, really famous rappers, like all the all the most famous rappers. But if you didn't know any rapper in the world, you could look at that and feel very confused. And I was gonna even go so far as to just send random people to interviews. 
instead of me and, and, and send like competing ones. So the first one goes in, starts fumbling questions, and the other one's like banging on the, well, who is that? Why is he doing my interview? Um, but I found that all fell apart about two years in because the legitimate press is not interested okay. in can your- we, Can we call in the real front a lot? Fake, but yeah, really. <laughs> And 20 years later, I finally got found out. Um, yeah, I just, like, that's it tied into the name, right? Like, I, I wanted to participate in rapping, um, but I did not want to clear the obstacle of people questioning my hip-hop authenticity. So I'm like, well, I'll just go the other direction. I'll be MC front a lot. Every rapper I've ever heard has discussed at length how they do not front and would never be caught fronting. No rapper will ever try to steal my unique Google hits with my rap name. Um, and in fact, I could just explore secrets and lies and kind of have that be my theme. But yeah, it only lasts until like XXL Magazine calls up and they're like, yeah, we need a picture. I'm like, oh shit, I'm an excellent I'm Send, you know. Also then Wikipedia starts investigating you. It all comes out. Uh, how has like the business side of the music industry changed for you all throughout your careers? Kind of an Start open question. Um, it, we used to be able to uh, put out a new album, press a bunch of CDs, do a couple of tours, and unload those CDs and repress them um, because we could additionally sell them online. But selling CDs is not a, a realistic game anymore. We still can sell them on the road because people still, and I don't know if this is universal to the music industry or if it's just because our fans pred predominantly come from like nerd culture and they love collecting things. But on the road, we can still sell them because people like a physical keepsake that we scribbled our name on. They serve as an ink holder. Yeah, it's ba that's basically yeah. it. It's not even a means of getting the music because most of our fans are like, I already bought all these online or I stream these regularly. Right. But it has changed. Selling an actual physical product is, other than, you know, T-shirt merch, is not a huge part of it anymore. Um, for me, in a way, it's been easier because of the internet to break as like a DIY independent artist just because there's so many channels to share your work um, that you don't have to go through labels and it's just like so many different ways. So for me, it's been great because I've never made a lot of money <laughs> from it. So it's just been like, oh, cool. And now there's like a lot of people who can like see my work through social media and like SoundCloud and all that. It was right, right at the beginning of my trying to sell the music, um, which was 2005, I was like, all right, I'll take all the samples out and make a version of this that I could press on a CD and sell to people. Um, it was exciting right then as the major labels were like freaking out and trying to figure out what to do and like installing root kits on your machine when you bought a like, you know, a Britney CD or whatever. Like they were like, they were flipping out and they had no idea what to do about internet. And so those of us who were like, no, internet's great. I'm like bypassing all of the gatekeeping and I'm getting direct direct support from listeners online. I'm even moving money around online. Like it was great when there was hardly anyone who knew how to do that. <laughs> and now everyone has all those tools, um, even if they're not huge computer nerds. Uh, so now everything's terrible because <laughs> I have competition <laughs> from more talented children. Don't like it. Plus we're all fighting for the same one hundredth of a cent on various music streaming yeah. services. It's not And streaming has been a big change. Like they even like as the the music industry the labels, they figured out how to sell stuff on iTunes and it was fine. Like as CDs kind of diminished, people were still buying stuff for their collections and over the last five years that has just cratered. Like nobody nobody buys anything. It's all your Spotify. So I'd love it if you'd kick them out of the space because I know somebody at Google. I don't know anybody at Spotify. Understood. Surely crank that up to four ninths of a cent. Anyway, um, joking. I'm not going to cause you to corrupt your databases to make all of our Google Play streams more lucrative. I'm saying you definitely should not do that this afternoon. Understood. Um, we were talking kind of at the beginning about uh, introversion and nerdery, and uh, and certainly in the the Venn diagram of introverts and nerds, there's a great deal of overlap. Do you, to what extent do you feel like you have to be an introvert to be a nerd, and 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 to what extent does like 
introversion per se, as opposed to nerdery, kind of inform your art, do you think? I think you don't have to be an introvert at all to be a nerd. I know tons of extremely loud, obnoxious nerds who never, <laughs> ever turn it off. Um, that doesn't mean they're not introverts. Oh, doesn't it? Oh, no, Maybe. I'm very loud. No, but... And you, I'm an introvert. But you, like... Oh, do you use the loudness as an armor against the... No, I use the loudness, again, to get attention. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when people laugh at my jokes and clap. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so good at that. I, I don't know. What do you know? Uh, 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 if, if those two things go hand in hand, introversion and, and nerdery? Um, I don't. I don't think they have to. I don't think they're mutually exclusive at all. No, and I, and I think that, I think that there are. I know a lot of people in our scene in, in nerdcore who, like, strongly identify as extroverts. And I think it's probably because, the, the rule is that we're all supposed to be introverted. We're supposed to be at home making paper mache, playing with the four tracks, or or doing things like that. And I have. I know these people who go to cons. Um, in an excited manner, like they're thrilled to be around like seas of people and, and interact with them. And for me, that's always like a challenge of the gig. Um, but I don't, I don't think that they have to. I don't, I don't think that they have to exist like as a function of one another. I don't, I don't know if this is still true because like the role of nerdery itself has kind of shifted in the culture. But when I was a kid, and then looking back at being a kid while thinking about my development as a nerd um, later, it seems to me not so much about personality type, but about like how well, how well you fit in with whatever was sort of mainstream popular on the schoolyard, like being, which is generally, I'm sure, unchanged. Like you have to be beautiful, social is part of it. You have to be accomplished in certain normal cultural things in the country, like some sports or whatever. Um, and if you're shunned from that, you're sort of pushed into the role of the introvert, even if that's not your personality type. Mm -hmm. And that's when you go and spend a lot of time with your online friends or developing your imagination with all of your fantasy books or the various things, the various escapes that sort of have turned into the nerd cultural identity. Although now that's the mainstream yeah, thing. It that's like it all doesn't the... mean much anymore, and I don't, I don't want to be one of these like nerd gatekeepers that says like, "Oh, I'm so tired of seeing all these people in Captain America shirts being like, oh, I'm such a nerd, lol." But like, seriously, I'm kind of tired of seeing all these people in Captain America <laughs> shirts being like, "I'm a nerd, lol." That's that movie makes more money than I than in, in a figure that I cannot estimate right now. The movie's very carefully made for every kind of person, right? Sure, like, and that's yeah, great. That's great course. that the things that, because the th it's great that more people are into the things that we were as kids because now we also get to enjoy these things with budgets. Yeah, I and, get an expensive version of that thing every four months. Yeah, but, that's but, great for me. But, <laughs> but I don't think that, that there's really a whole lot of validity behind. I am a nerd because I like this costumed pop culture property thing. I don't think that, that really yeah. exists anymore because it's all so very accessible and mainstream. I think needing to escape into your imagination for whatever reason, um, and having gone through some amount of alienation and loneliness, these, these things still create people I recognize as nerds. Um, the list of stuff on your Facebook likes page never really was an identity. It was just a list of things you typed into Facebook once. Before I hand the mic over, I also neglected to say, I love the earrings. Those are awesome. Thank you. They're French fries. They're my favorite food group. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Miss, Miss Eves creates most of her own couture, including all of your earrings. Yeah, I, I, um, I like to paper mache. That's my thing. So I never really thought of myself as a nerd, but I'm into very like specific activities that I do like alone. So I'll make a giant slice of pie out of paper mache or like earrings like these. Should we maybe clear up some, some things and make this more rigorous, have like a point system and a threshold for who- Nerd points. Nerd? No, that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. Yeah. No, let's, no, no, no. Uh, let's just say everyone can identify as whatever they want, including being a nerd. <laughs> sure. I'm all of us when we were I know that we all had the same experience when we were 16. All of us got dangled out of a high school bathroom window while we were still wearing our ma marching band uniform. 
or just me. Or just you. But I do feel like being called a nerd, that's even become more inclusive because I'm not into comic books or video games, but and I didn't feel like I belonged in that space. But just like I've learned that I do nerdy things, you know, and I, even though I'm not into like traditional nerd stuff. <laughs> traditional nerd stuff. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> this like nerd cultural moment is so so long lasting that there's now modern and traditional nerdery. <laughs> I'm an avant-garde nerd. There we go. It, it means something rather different when, when said by someone who identifies as a nerd much warmer. Um, to me personally, you know, I, I, I see you you all standing there in, in the realm of pop cu cult, pop culture, you know, holding up the flag of, of nerddom. And I look at that and I think, that's me, and that's you, that's you. And, uh, you know, it's very powerful and affirming. Thanks. Yay. That's why, that's hopefully why much of it gets made. I, uh, I have a very conflicted relationship with nerd culture. I, you know, I was very into a lot of nerdy things. I also always felt excluded by the nerds um, for various reasons. Um, and, you know, I go to Comic-Con and these things and, like, you see all of this, this embracing of the stuff I love and this also, like, gatekeeping moment. And I want to know, how does the existence of Nerdcore and the practice of Nerdcore either, like, help break down that gatekeeping or reify that gatekeeping, uh, like, kind of, like, solidify what, what a nerd is or, or does it kind of serve to break down these kind of barriers? I would hope that as more and more people and more and more different types of folks participate in nerd core just as a little thing, a little part of the whole culture, this little kind of music that we do, um, that that erases the, the urge to gatekeep because everybody's got their own take on it. Everybody's got their own angle on what they love and how they feel about themselves. And everybody just sort of knows who they are and what they are in a different way from the way the person next to them has their own self-understanding. And you don't want the whole point of like fighting against nerd as this like insult that we used to get, at least in the 80s. Some young people here. In the 80s, if you were a nerd, that was like, that was pejorative. And someone said it to you while they banged you against a locker or whatever. And that was it. And that was all that, like you tried as hard as you could to get out of that label. You did not want to be called a nerd. Um, the idea now of embracing it is like not at all revolutionary anymore, and that's great. Uh, but then, of course, there's uh, like trying to kick other people out of the identity. That's just what is that? That's these the cycle of abuse coming back around. So I'm hoping that everyone who I like within our subgenre would would see it the same way as that. And I accept you just as you are. So you got Miss Eames. You've all talked about like other creative stuff that you do, whether it's other types of music or technical creative stuff. Uh, so what about hip hop made you decide to make that like your main creative thing that you want to be out there with? It actually isn't my main creative thing. I'm still um, a designer, like that's a graphic designer. Um, and I'm, I like run a photo street blog that's like inclusive, body positive, like style that shows like all different types of people. Um, really my like whole message is just about like making everything like e equal and like having a very inclusive safe space for all these people. Cause I've always felt like such a misfit. So I want to have like an inclusive safe space that other people have felt that way that can come to. And so all of my work kind of revolves around creating that safe space for people. I wanted to be a novelist, but I didn't have a fan base for my aspiring novel writing. <laughs> and people kept downloading the MP3s for the other thing. I feel like it kind of, in, in the way that the internet has injured everyone's attention span, like making, writing song length lyrics has injured my ability to make a novel, like as evidenced by the fact that I have not made one. I don't, I've read some wonderful reviews you've written of hotels that we've stayed at on tour, and those are, those are min miniature novels in themselves. I used to play drums uh, in a bunch of metal bands, and so I was doing. I was I was playing metal at the same time. I started dabbling in, in recording rap songs, and so I very quickly stopped playing drums in metal bands because I'm like, I'm not sitting in the back behind a bunch of other people. I'm standing in the front, and there are people moving their mouths along to the things that I wrote, and I was done. 
I was just done with being a rhythm instrument. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> I like sitting in the back. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, the direct feedback from doing a song that folks in the crowd know and appreciate is just overwhelming. Like, the amount of dope, it's, dopamine you get out of that. It's, it's, it's real, intoxicating. real hard to put it down. And there's also a lot of, like, overlap with music because there's a visual side, which is your, like, music videos, and that can also be a way that you can express, express yourself creatively. Like, I direct or co-direct, art direct all of my music videos. I produce all of them. I design all of my album art. So, like, this music has become, a, like, a vehicle where I can... I like the Southern. Vehicle. 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 I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but this has become this way that I can just use all of my like artistic interests and just funnel them through this one project. Just as a footnote to that, everybody sh really, you all owe it to yourselves to check out Go look Miss Eve's it. sensational collection of music videos. They are unparalleled by anybody in our field. They're on YouTube. Uh, I saw your, your video, Left Swipe Left. That was with the, with the picture frame? That was adorable. Okay, so I have a video uh, for a song about how online dating sucks. So I was like, this isn't working. So I made a giant live Tinder window and I just walked around Brooklyn getting trying to get people to date me. Still, no one dated me, but I did get ice cream at the end. Solid, though. I mean, yeah, it, the story ends on a happy note. It does. <laughs> Your music videos are so good. They really They're are. They're so good. They're amazing. <laughs> and on another happy note, would you guys like to hear a song? We'll do, uh, thanks. We'll do our, I'll Form the Head, which originally had Dr. Awkward and Zealous One in it, but um, for this tour, these two wrote their own verses uh, as mech pilots who would like to argue over how the giant robot will be formed at the end. <laughs> Robotic space rhinoceros that we pilot. Why? Cause we're being supplied. But we heat the cry of our planet's population to defend them. We report to battle stations. Split screen ready and the rhinos are rocket ships with fully articulated tusks, jaws, and hips. They come equipped with individual special attacks. None with a lack. A couple a little bit slack. Not naming any pilot specifically, but we're all color coded. So you notice that typically I, in the gold, lead the charge, do the most damage to whatever very giant face invade the planet to threaten the globe. Yet another of our episodes this week, malevolent galactic nematode. Already beat up the squad when we face them. I'm calling it a swarm of giant robot and waste him. Martha misbehaving, planets heat and saving, situations brave and I'll, I'll form, form the head. head. The enemy is clever, we're smaller but whatever When we put it together, I'll form the head Then y'all could do the trendy, swing energy machete If combination's ready, I'll form the head I'll form the head, no, I'll form the head I'll form the head, I'll form the head Type A usually head of the class Well, I'll form the head is quite natural, yes You can chill and relax as I multitask I'll make an infograph of our plan of attack this worm situation is a bit of a mess But lucky for us squad, I'm addicted to stress I ace every test, red's always the best Before the commercial break, I'll lead us to success yep. Let me optimize our robot Reorganize this with me at the top I can handle a lot, let me make us a list I can check off all our goals with every plot twist I'll make spreadsheets, we'll excel with me And all you have to do is follow my lead Here's clip notes from some battle strategies I read See how your life is easier if I form the head? Yeah. Monster misbehaving, plan is eating saving Situation's grave and I'll, I'll form, form the, the head. head The enemy is clever, we're smaller but whatever When you put it together I'll form the head. Y'all can do the dreading, sweet energy machete. If combination ready, I'll form the head. 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 Tonight, our family friendly animated violence is headed by the pilot whose color scheme is violet. Me, I am the finest at fighting iron giants, the wisest, because I'm the guy who flies the highest. You've heard I'm the team's machine who takes the big hits. My third eye is squeegee clean like I'm Bill Hicks. Giving me vision, best to vanquish any soldier. So I'm calling dibs upon the bit that sits between the shoulders. Invoke a urine test, invest in your fallacy. Ingested every psychedelic known in the galaxy. Inhaled every plan from here to Tethys and back. But I'm still the one who's planned 
infested mecha alpaca. Mind expanded flashbacks, blasting any evil. Red and gold should be at helms of robotic sheep. All the drugs I've done will kill the chip that's ahead. Can the others smell colors? No, then I should form the head. Monster misbehaving, planet seeding saving. Situations graven, I'll form the head. The enemy is clever, we're smaller, but whatever. When we put it together, I'll form the head. Y'all can do the treading, swing energy machete. If combination's ready, I'll form the head. 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 Yo, red, violets stick together, some say. Ultra megafauna only clicks together one way. If that is apocryphal, my doll figure turns up top where the views at you could look stern while we pose. So menacingly brandishing blade, thought to rid us of the enemy with one swoop. Yay! Now, time's critical, don't debate this again. Oops, that space worm gobbled up Michigan. Martha misbehaving, planet's eating, saving. Situation's grave, and I'll form the head. The enemy is clever, we're smaller, but whatever. When we put it together, I'll form the head. And y'all could do the treading, swing energy, but said it. Combinations ready, I'll form the head. No, I'll form the head. I'll form the head. I'll form the head. I'll form the head. Monster misbehaving, planet's eating, saving. Situations great, we all form the head. The enemy is clever. We're smaller, but whatever. When we put it together, I'll form the head. Y'all can do the dreading. Spring energy machete. If combination's ready, I'll, I'll form, form the head. head. Yo, I'll, I'll form, form the head. head. Yo, I'll, I'll form, form the head. head. I'll form the head. I'll, I'll form, form the head. Thank you, Google. Beard science on the drums.